are we doing? I need some cards. <laughs> <laughs> Nucleic acids. Nucleic acids. The first one here is DNA. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. This is found in the nucleus of the cell. What are we going to find in DNA? Genes. Okay. It's basically the command center, right? This is where we're, that's going to direct the cell what to do. It tells, it gives the cell function. So it serves as a command center for cell function. And when we're talking about germ cells, they contain the hered hereditary information. DNA is highly radiosensitive. DNA is highly radiosensitive. The other nucleic acid is RNA, ribonucleic acid. They are involved in the growth and development of the cell or protein synthesis, and this is found on the outside of the nucleus. They are also radiosensitive. DNA, as we know, has a double helix formation, a twisted ladder, if you will. Okay? So the rungs, the rungs of the ladder, the rungs of the ladder is your you have your alternating sugars, your alternating deoxyribose sugar and also alternating phosphates. Then you have the steps. They are your nitrogen-containing organic bases. Now each base is formed by base pairs. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we're talking about the steps, you have adenine that can only join with thymine. And you can only have guanine that can join with cytosine. Okay. In, in an RNA strand, the thymine is replaced with uracil. Also, DNA and RNA look similar in structure, but in a DNA, it's double helix, so it has two sides, and it's twisted, okay? RNA only has one side, only has one side, but it also, but it also has a helix formation. And it is the combination of these bases that determines the function of that particular cell. It's the combination of those bases that determines that function of the particular cell. We're going to get more into DNA and RNA later on when we're talking about uh, radiation damage to the cells. But this is just a basic introduction. Okay? Cell structure. In the middle, you're going to have your nucleus. What are you going to find in the nucleus? DNA. You said it. The DNA, right? DNA, you're going to find in the nucleus. On the outside of the nucleus is the cytoplasm where you're going to find the intracellular structures. This includes the endoplasmic reticulum. These are channels that allow the nucleus to communicate with the cytoplasm. The mitochondria which is the engine of the cell, it digests micromolecules to produce energy. Ribosomes, they look like a bunch of little dots in the cell. And this is the site of protein synthesis. So you may find this within the cytoplasm and you also might find them within the endoplasmic reticulum. But they're all over the place. So this is where uh, protein synthesis happens. Isosomes control intracellular uh, contaminants in other fragments. So what they essentially do is they digest cellular fragments and sometimes the, the cell itself, the lysosomes. So 
they digest cellular fragments and sometimes the cell itself. Talk about cell proliferation. All cell proliferation, it talks about how cells reproduce and also multiply. There are two types of cells. We have somatic cells, okay, which are all the cells in your body, not to include genetic cells. You have your somatic cells and your genetic cells. Each of them contain 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each of them contain 23 pairs of chromosomes. And through the process of mitosis, those pairs of chromosomes are duplicated. What is it called? Mitosis. What did I say? <coughs> My, no, I think it's mitosis. I'm sorry, I'm jumping in the cord. Meiosis is genetic, mitosis is body. Okay? But I'm also talking about here that each of them, doesn't matter if it's uh, somatic or genetic, you start off with 23 pairs. Okay? Now, depending on which scientist you're referring to, if you look in the book, uh, you have the geneticist, genesis point of view which only identifies two phases. The two phases are what I've included here, broken down to different parts. First one is mitosis. Okay? Mitosis, which then is broken into four different parts, and then interphase. So two phases for genesis is mitosis with its four, uh, four subphases, and then interphase as the second phase. So that's what we're going to be spending time on with this particular one, is the geneticist point of view. So mitosis, you have four subphases. The first one here is prophase, where the nucleus swells, and the DNA becomes a little bit more prominent. And what I mean about the DNA being more prominent, these are where the chromatids start to appear, the chromatids of the chromosomes. Remember, that's where you're going to find all the genetic information is where? in the chromosomes, okay? So the chromosomes appear lining up at the equator of their nucleus. Then you've got this one cell that starts to get pinched off in the center. This is the centromere, where it gets pinched off right in the center, like a dumbbell, okay? And now the chromosomes start to split at this very center. When all is said and done, you now end up with two daughter cells, and this happens here at telophase, or telophase. So you have two separate identical daughters, daughter cells, each having how many pairs of chromosomes? 23. It should be 23. Okay? Here, you have 43 at metaphase. Here, when you split up, you'll have 26 apiece, uh, 23 apiece. Let me say that again, 46 <laughs> here, 46 here, and then 23 here. And then the phase in which uh, there is a growth of cells in between division or proliferation, this is known as the interphase. Okay, now, when we talk about genetic cells, now let's talk about meiosis. Mitosis. <clears throat> OK, 
Okay, so mitosis, <coughs> you have one cell, okay? Then you, you have your chromatids, okay? Then what's going to happen here is the nucleus swells, and now you're going to have four chromatids. You have two here, right? And as it starts to swell before it splits up, now you have one, two, three, four. And we have how many pairs? We're going to have how many pairs of this? A total of 23, right? So once it starts to split up at the centromere, it's going to split up right here. Okay, you still have what? You still have four sets. And then when they split up into the two daughter cells, now you're back with two and two again, with identical chromosome pairs. Now it's going to happen a little bit differently here when you get to meiosis, because there's going to be a second division. Okay, so what's going to happen here with the second division? Meiosis, meiosis. Okay, so what's going to happen here is there's going to be a second cell division, but instead of it producing <coughs> another four, they keep the same number of chromatids so it doesn't double up it remains at 23 pairs. This is known as reduction division. So that way when you have another genetic cell trying to join which genetic cell, they pair up nicely to total how much? 46. Because if you end up with 46 here and you try to pair up, now you have too many chromosomes. So when they split up a second time, there isn't any DNA replication. It stays the same at the same number. So that's what happens with meiosis. So at meiosis, it splits up one more time. The end result is instead of two daughter cells, you have four daughter, daughter cells. Okay? And each of those four daughter cells will only have one set of chromosomes each. Okay. All right. Any questions here? more complicated. From cells, when you have similar, se similar cells with similar functions, it now becomes a tissue. Similar tissues then become an organ, and when you have a set of organs with one function or one main function, it becomes a system. These systems include your nervous system, your digestive system, okay? your endocrine system, respiratory, circulatory. You guys follow? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have your systems. But this is from the very, very basic. <coughs> so what we have here are your list of tissues. We are composed of 40%, uh, 43% muscle. Uh, this looks better. 14% fat. Okay. Organs, 12%. Skeleton is 10%. Blood, 8 Subcutaneous tissue is 6%. Bone marrow, 4 And skin is 3%. Cells are categorized into two different categories. Very simple, one is immature. Immature cells are also known as undifferentiated precursors or stem cells. Undifferentiated precursors or stem cells. 
Mature cells are differentiated and specific in function. Now, how did they come up with these two different categories? Well, cells of tissues are identified by their rate of proliferation. Their rate of proliferation, number one, by their rate of proliferation, and number two, is their stage of development, their stage of development. So again, they are identified by their rate of proliferation and their stage of development. Now, of these two, again review, you guys should know this, which is going to be more radiosensitive? Immature. The immature cells, because they are rapidly dividing. Which means that if you cause if you cause damage to their cells in the middle of division, they're going to be transferring that damaged information to their daughter cells. And if and if they are dividing quickly, that information gets transferred quickly before recovery. Now, if you have mature cells, they don't divide as fast. But they're still dividing, right? Do you guys agree? Mature cells, they are still dividing, but they don't divide as fast. And because of the rate of proliferation, in between, remember the interphase, okay? It allows time for that cell to recover, preventing any transfer of the damaged information to the daughter cells. Does that make sense? Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, can you repeat what I said? Yeah. I'll remember. <laughs> okay. So, here we have a chart on the type of cells and their uh, sensitivity to radiation. So we said immature cells are going to be the most radiosensitive, but it also depends on their rate of proliferation. So, you have lymphocytes and spermatogonia and also erythroblasts. What are erythroblasts? Red blood cells. Okay, the very, very beginning stages. Young, young red blood cells, right? And intestinal uh, crypt cells, which has a lot of uh, blood cells in there, they're going to be very radiosensitive. And then you have your endothelial, which you're going to find in most lining of membranes, endothelial cells, osteoblasts, spermatids, and fibroblasts are going to be um, somewhere in the middle of radiosensitivity, and those that are very mature include your muscle cells and your nerve cells. Do you guys know what we're talking about here? Mm -hmm. Who are those two French scientists? Oscar Mayer? <laughs> Bergoni and Tribondu. Bergoni and Tribondu. They're the ones who came up with this, this chart. Okay, so we're going to talk about what we're going to on do here in just a moment. Okay, so the principal aim of the study of radiobiology is to understand radiation dose response relationship. The relationship with dose and its response to radiation. Some tissues are more sensitive than others. Some tissues are more sensitive than others. Some respond more rapidly to lower doses. Some respond more rapidly to lower doses. What am I talking about here? Stem, immature, stem or immature cells, right? Physical and biological factors affect the radiobiologic, uh, radiobiologic um, response of tissue. So it is for us to understand the, what these factors are that contribute to, uh, to contribute how these tissues respond to the different types of doses. Here we go. So we have Bergoni and Tribondu, the two French scientists. They observed and theorized that radiosensitivity was based on the metabolic state of tissue being irradiated. Number one. Stem cells, we're talking about young immature cells, precursor cells, right? Are radiosensitive. 
whereas mature cells are radio resistant. At a tissue level, if, I mean, if you've got stem cells that are radio sensitive, that also means that younger tissues and organs are also radio sensitive, right? And number three, tissues with high metabolic activity are also uh, radio sensitive. So if they are rapidly dividing, they're gonna be more radio sensitive than those that don't rapidly divide. And that's what it refers to here to number, with number four, okay? Any questions? The response of biological tissue to radiation is determined by the amount of energy deposited per unit mass. What we're gonna be talking about here is what types of energy deposits what type of energies, what type of radiation deposits uh, different types of radiation on tissue? Okay, the units that we're gonna be using here are grays, which are absorbed, uh, uh, absorbed dose in tissue, signified by GY for gray and T for tissue. You guys are probably used to just seeing GY, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna get specific, we're talking about dose transferred on tissue, so that's G, Y, sub T. That's your SI unit. And then you have your traditional or uh, uh, traditional uh, units, it's your radiation absorbed dose, we also know this as RADs, okay? And then we have your conversion here, one RAD is equal to 0 0.01 rays, or 100 <coughs> RAD is equal to one ray. So the first physical factor that we're going to be talking about here in how uh, absorbed dose <coughs> is determined is based on the linear energy transfer or the LET. LET is a measure of the rate at which energy is transferred from ionizing radiation to soft tissue. This describes kilo electron volt of energy that is transferred per micrometer of soft tissue tract length. Defined as KEV over UM, micrometer. <coughs> now the LET for diagnostic x-ray is approximately three kilo electron volts for every one micrometer. It's gonna make sense here in just a minute. Then you have 25 megavolts. What's bigger, is it kilovolts or megavolts? Mega. Okay, 25 megavolts of x-rays. Okay, this is stronger. Is 0.2 keV of one micrometer of soft tissue. It's highly penetrating. And then you have a heavy nuclei. This is all like your alpha particles. You guys ever heard of the alpha particles? They're much bigger and thicker in size. It's not highly penetrating. And these things are so thick, they can, they can barely uh, penetrate a piece of paper. Okay, it's highly absorbing. It cannot even penetrate a thin piece of paper. 100 kilo electron volts per one micrometer of soft tissue, not as penetrating. So what this means is, when you have something that's highly penetrating, it passes through the tissue rather quickly so it doesn't deposit a lot of energy. Energies that are not highly penetrating, it's gonna take a longer time to penetrate that piece of tissue. And while it's trying to penetrate, it's depositing all that energy into that tissue. Is that also going to increase the chances of biological effects? Mm -hmm. Is that also going to increase the number of ionization in those cells? Because yep. the longer it takes for that piece of particle to penetrate that structure, the more energy is going to deposit. There is going to be a greater chance of ionization. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Okay.
Now, just like LET, we're going to talk about RBE, which is the relative biological effect. These go hand in hand. Because the more energy that's deposited, the more energy that's deposited on that piece of tissue, is there going to be greater damage to that tissue? Yes. Yes. Okay? Because we said the LET for heavy nuclei was what, 1,000? 1,000 keV. That's a lot of energy that's deposited in one micrometer of soft tissue, right? That's a lot of energy. So therefore, it's gonna be cause it's gonna cause more damage. 30 RBEs, 30 relative biological effects. We're talking about tissue damage. RBE refers to tissue damage. So anything that's highly penetrating doesn't cause that much tissue, I mean damage to the tissue because it leaves that area rather quickly. It pierces and leaves, enters leaves. So it's not causing a lot of energy, therefore there's not a lot of damage that is caused by it. Okay, so with lower, uh, lower LETs, you have lower RBEs. With higher LETs, you have higher RBEs, more damage. Thank you.